As we begin this morning, I would like for you just to listen as I quote several verses. Our subject has to do with what the Bible teaches about heaven and eternity. Listen to the Holy Scriptures. In Hebrews 10.34 it says, You suffered with those thrown in jail, and you were actually joyful when all you owned was taken away from you, knowing that better things were awaiting you in heaven, things that would be yours forever. Heaven's better. In Hebrews 11, 15, and 16, it says, If they had wanted to, they could have gone back to the good things of this world, but they didn't want to. They were living for heaven. And now God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he made a heavenly city for them. We need to live for heaven. 1 Peter 1.4 says, And God has reserved for his children the priceless gift of eternal life. It is reserved in heaven for us, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Heaven's a priceless gift. And finally, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11 says, And God will open wide the gates of heaven for you to enter into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We come this morning to a passage where our eternal home is described. Would you take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 22? Revelation 22. I'd like to read verses 1 through 5. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb, who is Christ. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, yield, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And listen to this. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, on their foreheads. There will be no night there, they need no lamp, nor the light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. That's a description of our eternal home. When you know for sure that you have been saved by God's grace, you have the assurance of the world beyond this one, the place called heaven, a real world. And all of that being true, no wonder the book of Colossians, chapter 3, says this. We should seek those things which are above, where Christ is, where he sits at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. We should think about heaven. It can make a difference in our lives. Now, how do we live 
We're in Revelation 22. How do we live if we are seeking those things which are above? In other words, in light of the heaven above, how should we live our lives in this world down here below? First, in Revelation 22, we've read verses 1 through 5. Notice verse 6. My first thought is this. Because there's a heaven, we should obey the words of this book. There is no book anywhere in the world, in any library, anywhere, like the Bible. It is unique. And if you don't know why it is unique, you need to do some research and find out. That's why the Holy Bible has survived all of the thousands of years of human history. We should obey the words of this book. Look, look what he says in Revelation 22, beginning at verse 6. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must sure, uh, shortly come to pass. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. There it is. We need to obey God's word. Now I, John... <clears throat> saw and heard these things, and when I saw and heard, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, don't do that. I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who, here it is again, keep the words of this book. Worship God. In other words, you don't worship angels. We worship God alone. Did you notice twice he says, keep the words of this book? Do you? I preached this past week <clears throat> in two chapel services at Keswick Christian School. And I won't go into all the message, but I told the young people at Keswick, I spoke in the middle school and then in the high school. Other than my salvation, the most important decision that I ever made, I had just graduated from high school and walked onto a secular campus, the University of Cincinnati in Ohio. And I was surrounded by students and professors whose morals and gods were different from mine. And I needed to know why I believed what I believed. And I never told anybody this. None of my family members, none of my friends. I personally made a private decision that every day, I was going to get up, and the first thing I would do, I would find a quiet place somewhere, and I would open this Bible and read it and begin to study it so I could understand what does this book teach? Why is it so different? I told them, I read the Word, and then I would pray. And I said to the students, that's because I was at a crisis point in my life, surrounded by a world that was so different. I needed to know who I was, a Christian, why I'm a Christian, and what I believe. And I said to the students, you may be there right now. If you aren't today, Someday you may reach back to this message I've given. When you face the crisis, when your friends start going a different direction, 
or the world that you're living in begins to put pressure on you, maybe you'll remember the very thing that you need to do. Open the Bible. This is how you hear the voice of God. These are his words. And then bow your head and pray to him. It changed my life totally. If you think about seeking things that are above, it'll cause us to worship God. Obey the words of this book. And then the second thing. If we seek those things which are above, we won't be afraid to share the words of this book. My two best friends that I started out with at the University of Cincinnati, neither of them were Christians. We just happened to be met at the university. We were in classes together, and we just got to know each other. And as I began to study my Bible, I felt the Holy Spirit impressing upon me, Jerry, you need to share with them about how to get to heaven, that there's more than ju just this world, there's another world out there, and there's also a hell. God said so in his word, because of sin. And I will tell you this, I prayed and I waited and I researched because I knew that what they would say to me, so why are you a Christian? And why, do, and, and they did, by the way. So why do you believe this? I said, well, let me share it with you. One of them, over the course of that first year, eventually came to me and he said, okay, there's got to be more to life than just this, this mess. Tell me again what you believe and why, and I did. And he bowed his head and received the Lord as his Savior. The other one, I don't know. I think I heard that both of them have died. I know where one of them is. I'm not sure about the other one. Look what he says, beginning at verse 10. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He's, he who is filthy, let him be filthy. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Verse 12. And behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. If we think about those things which are above, we not only will have a desire, and by the way, that desire to study God's word every day has never left. I still do it every day. But not only should it cause us to want to obey the words of this book, or, or read, read in the words of the book and obey it, it should also cause us to want to share it. He says, don't seal up the, the words of this prophecy. Don't, don't cover them up. Don't hide it. Share it. Have you ever shared your faith with somebody? You never know when that person that you work with or go to school with or whatever, you never know all the struggles that they may be facing privately. 
and they don't know how to bring up some things. But maybe you can pray about it and just at the right time, in the right way, say, could I, could, and here's the way I do it. I don't say, let me tell you what you need to know. No. Would you, I remember I said this to my friends, would you care if I shared with you why I believe what I believe and how I've come to understand more about the world because this book explains it and where the world is headed. And by the way, this tells us where many specific nations of this world are headed. The news this week is a reflection of what's in this book. Some people don't understand what's taking place with Israel and all those particular nations. This will tell you exactly what it said would happen. And so just say to them, I'd just like to share it with you. Now, they can say, nope, I don't want to hear it. That's fine. But they might say, tell me. And you never know what's going on in their heart, and they might be open to receive Christ. Truthfully, I don't, I still, I, I, I don't know how I would live in this world surrounded with all the hate and war and bloodshed and death. I stood at so many graves of people that I had talked with not too many days before. They're dead. You're going to die someday. You have to have thought about why are we dying? And where am I going when I die? This book will explain it to you. And remember that we should be using our lives to be a witness and testimony to others. Then look at verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life. That's people who are going to heaven. And may enter in through the gates of the city. That's a heavenly city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral people, and murderers, and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. In verse 14, he talked about the people going to heaven. He said, but not everybody's going in. Outside are dogs. By the way, easy for us to not understand that when we read it in modern day. Why, why would unsaved people be likened to a dog? Because right away you're thinking, I got the cutest little puppy. I mean, why? That's not what he's talking about. Back in those days, the dogs over there, for the most part, were scavengers. They were creatures that were scary to be around. And they roamed through the the areas over there. And so that's why God likens unsaved people who live ungodly lives to those dogs that have no control and will bite or rip you apart if they can. That's what it was back in those days. But look at this. I didn't write this. But God says, people who are sexually immoral are not going to heaven. Is that you? Or idolaters? You don't worship God. You worship things, money, your job, this world. 
I don't want to be a part of that. I, am, I cannot be more thankful because my dad, as I told you, was not much interested in church. But I'm so thankful that I had a little grandmother who shared the gospel and loved the Lord. And remember, what she, and I told this to the Keswick students, My little grandmother was brokenhearted because her son, my dad, wasn't living for God. And she said, I waited for the right opportunity to say something to your dad. And I had to wait months and months. You were a little boy. And then she said to my dad, because of certain circumstances that had happened, she looked at my dad and said, Don, if you don't care about your own soul, she pointed to me. She said, why don't you take this little boy to church and give him a chance? <sighs> my dad said I could not get that out of my head. And he even told me later, he said, I thought to myself, if I want to split hell wide open, that's my problem. But now I got this little boy. That's me. And they went up the street and around the corner to the nearest church. It was a Bible teaching church. And they put me in children's church. And in children's church, which means while the church service was going on, as a little boy, a young boy, grade school boy, I was in children's church. And they shared the gospel from the Bible. And I received Christ as my Savior. Thank you, Grandma. And you remember the story. I told it again to the students. Who would have thought my grandmother would live to be about two weeks or so shy of 100? But at age 97, she had outlived her brothers and sisters, all of her family. My dad had died. Her other son had died. And, and they, st they st stuck her in this place in Indiana. And when I went there, I was so brokenhearted when I saw her. I begged her, I said, Grandma, please come down to Florida. I won't go into the whole story, because at first she said, don't, no, don't worry about me, Jerry, I'm okay. I'll be gone before long, and I know I'm going to heaven. I said, I know that, Grandma. I know that. She came down here for three years. We cared for her at our house. Instead of going out with the staff at lunch, I'd go home, change my grandmother, and care for her. After all, she was the person God used to bring Christ to me. I want you to look at a word, and then I'm going to close. Look at verse 17. So if you're sitting here and you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, listen to what this says. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whosoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. That's you and me. Whosoever. If you're not saved, if you don't know for sure where you're going to go when you die, Christ died for everybody so that whosoever wants to receive him can. You can make that decision today. I'm not going to come talk to you. You can talk to me. I'll, I'll be glad to. But you can make that decision in your heart and say, you know what? I am a sinner. I am dying. I want to know where I'm going when I die. I want to go to heaven. And by the way, I don't know everything about all of it, but I know enough to know that I want to go to heaven. And you can receive Christ as your Savior because you're part of the whosoever will may come. That's what Romans 10, 13 says. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, pray this morning that you'll save that soul that's closest to hell. I don't know the hearts of all the people in front of me. 
But if there's anybody here who's not saved, help them to at least think about what they've heard and maybe in their heart make the decision to say, God, I don't know everything about you, but I sure do want to live with you in heaven. Save me. And you said you will. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.